teaching today, I do want to uh, be appropriate to the moment and just let the Holy Spirit take charge. So I have lots of things that I want to point out to you, and I've been preaching on the outpouring of the Holy Spirit as a Pentecostal charismatic young boy for, I think my first message actually was, I was 13 years old at a tent revival. How many know a tent revival? I like, hey, you ever, you know, those old school tent revival, we know where they pass the snakes out. Uh, the old school, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> old school tent revivals where you did you pop up a tent, and it's always, the worst part about it, it was always in summer. I'm like, why don't we do this in a good, like, we're out, we have an air-conditioned building right next door to this. Why are we doing this in a tent? And I was 13, and I had enough logic back then to just like, hey, we, we could do this better. Uh, maybe at a better season. Uh, but we did those tent revivals, and I preached when I was 13 years old. And, and man, that was my first time, like, ever really just preaching the Word of God. And, and my, my grandfather gave an altar call at that at the end of my message, which was full of more ums and uhs than anything. And, and nervousness, and I, I, I'm just thankful that I didn't pee my pants or something crazy, right? 13 years old in front of a bunch of you guys. Imagine looking at you, and, and, and I'm 13, nervous and scared, and, 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 I, and I've just preached my heart, and then my grandfather gave an altar call for people to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And let me just tell you, I've been doing that since I was 13 years old. I'm 38 now, and I'm pretty familiar with how to see people get baptized in the Holy Spirit. And today I don't need my grandfather because he's already discipled and trained me. And at the end of this service, if you've never received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, here online in Overflow or in the front row or the back row, you can receive that today. And I'm going to introduce a God that you may have never known. You may have thought you knew Jesus. You may have thought you knew God. I'm going to show you that this God that loves you and cares for you wants to empower you. Okay? Okay. Wants to, wants to build you up, strengthen you, wants to equip you. We always, a lot of churches like to say that, and everybody posts that. God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. Y'all have heard it before. It's on every post, and every pastor tries to take credit for it and, and act like it was their saying. Let me just tell you, I, I, I've been hearing that since I was very young, and, and it was probably long before me when it was first said. And I, I'm sure Jesus said it at some point, and, and everybody else just acted like it was theirs to begin with. But uh, I just encourage you today to prepare your heart. Not just through the worship like we did, but prepare your heart and your mind to receive th this wonderful, beautiful gift that's going to transform your life in a powerful, incredible way, okay? So go with me to Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, and I also want you to turn, I might use both and juxtapose the two, but I want you to go to Joshua chapter 10. I know it doesn't sound like they go together, but I'll show you and we'll uh, put a bow on it at the end of it and tie it all together. But Joshua chapter 10, Old Testament, you're going to go past the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Right after that, you're going to go into Joshua, which is where the transition of leadership goes from Moses to Joshua. Uh, uh, reluctantly, Joshua takes the charge, and God has to tell him hundreds of times, hundreds, be bold and be courageous. And let me just tell you, he said, this is what he told him. God told Joshua, he said, I'll be with you like I was with Moses. Y'all know Moses? He parted the Red Sea. His staff turned into a snake. I don't know about you, but I haven't parted a sea lately. And, and, and I have had the Holy Spirit in my life for quite a while. And the Holy Spirit was with Joshua because the Holy Spirit just didn't appear in the New Testament. The Holy Spirit would settle upon someone at a time and a place for a season, not permanently reside with. And so because of the sacrifice that Jesus made, now we're going to, in Acts chapter 2, celebrate today the day of Pentecost, 50 days after, uh, uh, after Passover, we're going to celebrate the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Now, Joshua had the, the, the Holy Spirit with him and it helped empower him for incredible things. Then also in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, instead of just having it for one person and a time and place and just for his life, God's giving you the Holy Spirit to remain with you and be in all things and work in all things through all things. That's what the Holy Spirit's for. We don't know what it's like to live on a planet without the Holy Spirit. From the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2, the first 4,000 years before that, first 4,000 years of man's history was very slow going. The, la the 2,000 years after the outpouring of the Holy Spirit Man accelerated at an exponential rate and continues to do so in lots of incredible ways. So you can't tell me that the outpouring of the Holy Spirit 
that isn't a, a pinnacle moment of the transition of mankind, let alone the fact for Christianity. So it, it, it's proven in history and it's proven in scripture. Uh, and we now, we can even celebrate because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. There are churches that from at right after, weeks within weeks of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, when the church started to go everywhere, uh, we have churches in Ethiopia that we have been to. And in Ethiopia, from that moment where a young Ethiopian got witness to, he went back and started building churches. And those churches have been around since then for almost 2,000 years, loving and worshiping Jesus and celebrating the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Let me just tell you, the reason I mention that is not only is it a shift that changed the world, but it, the, when the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happens, it, it's not just a moment. It's a movement that will outlast every other thing in history and while other buildings crumble and fall, the body of Christ will never falter. And while the world may shake, the body of Christ is unshakable. I'm a preach. Because we can stand on a solid rock and know I don't have to be this like, oh, gas prices, oh, economy, oh, he's president, oh, she's president. We can just stand, oh, no, I'm the, I am a believer. I am a water baptized. I am a spirit-filled believer who knows the word of God. And while the world may shake, I am unshakable. And this is the power that you get to walk away with today and not only just get a deeper understanding for some of you, some of you get an introduction to it. Because there are doctrines that are false doctrines that teach the Holy Spirit's gifts and fruit and all of that is expired. But let me just tell you, if God changes and expires on things, when will he expire and change on you? Because you, if, you gotta, if we believe, we all love to say it at church, God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? Do you really believe that? Because there are a lot of churches that will preach that, but then when it comes to, oh, but the gifts... There's a couple weird ones in there. I believe in the word of knowledge. That's good. I believe in faith. That's good. But as soon as you get to the bottom for the discerning of spirits, ooh, and as soon as you get to speaking in tongues, I don't get it because I've never done it. You also have never had a million dollars. Does that mean it doesn't exist? But when you understand that the Holy Spirit's gifts are still evident and real and working in people, and just because it hasn't worked through you yet does not mean it is not real and evident today. So I have to give that simple introduction to start the message today. And as I mentioned, as the Holy Spirit leads, we'll go back and forth. Uh, but I want to start in Acts chapter 2 uh, and verse 1. So this is after Jesus commands them. Uh, to go to Jerusalem and wait in the upper room. In fact, we've been there. Will you guys just, in fact, show the pictures of the upper room real quick? Uh, we're going to take a group next year to this upper room right here. Uh, this is the, uh, the, uh, the upper room, so Last Supper, and then you're also the, uh, the, the upper room where the Holy Spirit pours out, and they came stumbling out into the courtyard. Uh, this is the pictures. We had a great worship service in there. Uh, this is the entrance. So like this is just a phenomenal place. And we worship so loud we made people angry. Of course, it was eight in the morning, but it was it was incredible time. And let me just tell you, you feel the presence of God in that place. And so uh, it doesn't need to be just that building, though. Guess what? It's not just for a building. It's for a person. And so God wants to not just fill this place like he does over and over again, but God wants to fill you over and over and over again. Okay. So let's go to Acts chapter 2, verse 1. It says, When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all in one accord and in one place. I want you to highlight that and underline that right now. And I hope you're taking good notes. I love we have a great note-taking church. Because uh, every time I say, take this down, I see a, a, a majority, 90 plus percent heads go, Toop, and just like take good notes. And let me just tell you, that, that's why this church is growing. It's because people are taking the word of God seriously enough to do something with it. The first step is just writing it down. The second step is sharing it. The third step is becoming it. Right? So when you see this, the day of Pentecost had fully come. In other words, it was sunny outside. I didn't make this a point, but I'm going to make a point right now because I feel the Holy Spirit just telling me to. It, it, when, when Jesus died, the sky grew dark. Right? 
and then he rose again. And when the New Testament was about to be fulfilled through the day of Pentecost, the, 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 that meant the sun was fully out. It was a brighter day. Somebody say, it's a brighter day. See, you've gone through some dark days, but, the, the, but God said, don't worry. I know you've gone through some dark days, but there's sun coming in the morning. There's brightness coming. There, there's, there's joy coming to your morning. There's, there, there, there's some dancing coming to your sorrow. I'm going to bring a brighter day. I put a rainbow in the sky. I love that old school song. Oh, God, put a rainbow in the sky. And we won't go into it. But God put a rainbow in the sky. Why? Because he said, I promise you it'll get better. I promise you it'll get better. I promise you it'll get better. When the, when the sun fully rose, it was a sign to all of them. He wasn't coming at night in the dark, in the secret, and, and just trying to figure out how to do it where nobody really noticed. He was coming when the day had fully come. It was bright outside. Everybody was awake. No one was still asleep. And he said, now's when I want to do it because I want everybody to see and feel and hear what I'm about to do. And then the next part is, 50 days after a Passover, right? This is the day of Pentecost. Now, 40 days he had appeared with them and walked with them and talked with them. And in 10, about 10 days-ish, relatively, uh, they were in the upper room. Now, 10 days in a hot, sweaty, stinky upper room. I mean, just imagine being here for three or four hours and turn the AC off, right? And, and, and how many have ever been with us that you went on vacation? We're going on vacations. Yay! We're vacationing again! We've, out, we've overcome 2020. And everybody's going on vacations again with family and friends and all that wonderful stuff. And that's really good. And how many know are old enough to have gone on vacations with family and friends and know that there are some family and friends that it needs to be a two-day trip? Come on, y'all know what I'm talking about. You're like, hey, if we just could, can, could, if we can, you know, make manage this, we can all walk away happy. <laughs> We're all gonna walk away still loving each other. If you haven't got to that place yet, it, it just, just, it's coming, okay? And, and when you take vacations, when you go on church, we spend family time. You, yeah, you could be with a lot of people, some people for a long time, and very few people, right? There's some people you just can only spend a few days with, a couple days with. They were up together, 120 of them, for 10 days straight praying and seeking the Lord. And then they came into one accord. Now, what does that mean? Of course, we know that's not only a musical terminology, but it's also a militant terminology in Greek. So we're translating from Greek to Latin to English. So in this terminology that we see, it's a military term as well that they literally, if you can imagine when a, a military group would be about face and they all turn together. And when they say, you know, like, at, you know, or I don't know all the terms. Doug, will you help me? What is another military term? Uh, uh, I, yeah. Attention. Yeah. Woo. Uh, all I know is I'm in the Lord's army. Yes, sir. I don't know military terms. <clears throat> so, attention. Right. And, and they'd all snap. Right. And they'd move together. That, you need to picture that because that's exactly what one accord means here. So it's a terminology that when they did it, they did it exactly the same together. No one looked different. Let me give you the first point. This is, this is huge. Uh, this is significant. Write this down. Significant unity. We don't need just unity. We need significant unity. Because a lot of us are more concerned about being unique than you are being in unity. And if your uniqueness will rob you from being in unity when you come to worship, you'll always rob everyone else from a corporate outpouring of what God wants to do. Because God wants to pour an outpouring of blessing and faith, and he wants to pour an outpouring of the Holy Spirit of miracle signs and wonders and healings. But there are some blessings that will only come through corporate unity, and we have to be together. We have to like each other. Turn to your neighbor and say, I actually like you. <laughs> Hopefully you mean what you just said and you didn't lie in church and we need more forgiveness. We like each other. We love each other. Hopefully you pray for each other. Hopefully you can smile at each other. Hopefully you can smile at me right now and you don't have bitter feelings or you're butthurt or bent out of shape. We got to move past our feelings and get into a faith place and say, hey, I know I feel like just doing nothing, but my faith tells me I need to start worshiping with my brothers and sisters in Christ. I got to raise my hands. I got to sing. I got to shout. I got to dance. I got to, hey, it, that's why the Bible says, clap your hands, all you people, right? Shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. He says, weep with those who weep. Rejoice Rejoice with those who rejoice. Why? Because when somebody's weeping around you, a sign of spiritual maturity will be coming into agreement with what they're going through. And so we need, we need to be more about agreement and accord, right? Agreement and accordness in our life than we are with conflict. 
and confrontation. And we are with all of our little personal preferences of this is what I like. Because th- this is what is robbing the body of Christ from seeing revival break out like crazy. When you actually go to church and you actually start doing what everybody else is doing, that's called one accordness. And when you start getting in one accord, that's when a blessing comes from heaven that cannot be contained. So when one person says amen, amen. we all say amen. When one says, shouts hallelujah, brother, then everybody's like hallelujah, brother. When, when someone starts doing a dance up here, it takes off. In a, man, I remember the old school days when one would go on a Jericho. You ever heard of the Jericho march? It's like, it's a, yeah. So you go on a Jericho. We don't have the room in this place. That's why we want a bigger building, not for you, but for the Jericho march. And we, we would just go, and we'd take off running. And we, and they say, oh, do a lap, brother. Whatever you'd hear old Reverend say, do a lap, brother. And they'd do a lap around church. When one started, all of a sudden, two, and three, and four, and five, and then the whole church, no one's even sitting anymore, and they're all just running in laps and circles, and then just shouting and praising the Lord. Why? Because I didn't come here for me. I came here for him. And if we came here for the same reason, then that means we ought to do something together. So if you hear somebody clapping, you probably ought to start clapping right now because the physical always parallels the spiritual. So when I refuse to tell my flesh what to do, I, d- I don't allow my spirit to come into agreement with those around me and what God is trying to do in me and through me. I know it sounds crazy. I know it sounds even strange. Like, I just wasn't raised that way. My father was raised Catholic. And he, he had learned, and then he got married to my mother in a charismatic, spirit-filled, Holy Ghost, hoedown church. Talk about bipolar extremes. And, and, and literally, he was like, he had to le- relearn everything. And he thought it was absolutely irreverent to do what they were doing until he learned what the scripture taught, that it was actually glory to God. And so when you give glory to God with each other, that's why the Bible says, and let us magnify. Who knows I'm preaching? When when you see this, you you start all of a sudden, that's why, why, why can't we make a difference in Flagstaff? Because we don't magnify. We just have our own little microscope perspective of Christianity. I just, I like Jesus like this for me. But when we do it together, we magnify the Lord. How do we make a change in our world? We stop doing the microscope and we start getting a magnifying glass. And we enhance the presence of God, not shrink the presence of God. Most of us, we want it compartmentalized because this is the way I like it. If they'll do, I don't like singing like that. I don't like, I don't like standing and clapping. I don't like doing all. I don't like saying amen. I don't like taking notes. It doesn't matter what you like. Did you know God loves you, but he doesn't care if you like it or not? He's not so insecure that he's like, they don't like clapping. I shouldn't have put it in the Bible. (laughs) Right? He didn't ask you. He said, clap your hands, all you people. And then he says, shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. I'm not asking you if you feel it. I'm telling you. Some of you are like, what church did we just walk into? And for those who are waiting for the old gray-haired senior pastor to come out, there's not one. I'm your guy, okay? This is, this is as good as it gets. And I'll never let gray hair get any more up here. Thank God to Just for Men. No, I'm just kidding. But I, I'm just teasing. But we, we need to come into agreement in one accord. One accord. Significant unity. Get rid of your uniqueness. You know what makes you unique? Jesus in you. You know what makes you unique? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. You don't need to dress unique to be unique. You don't need to change your sexual identity to be unique. You don't need to change who God made you to be unique. You don't need to act unique to be you. You don't need to dress like a tramp to act unique. You don't need to keep, can, you, uh, can I preach? You don't need to keep acting like, like, you, got, like you got nothing valuable and you're just going to give it away to anybody. You, you are unique and you are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of Jesus Christ. And if you are made in his image, that's all you need, baby because I'm as unique as it gets. Amen? That's a hallelujah. You all right? I haven't spit on you too much, have I? Front rowers. <clears throat> but that, 
this is, I know we're only in the scripture one, but th- this is a huge piece. We cannot go for, you, the body of Christ, listen, you can write this down. The body of Christ will never go further than the corporate unity that we decide to come into. Your corporate unity will determine the power that can work through the body of Christ. If, you, if we continue to rob ourselves of the unity, and, I, I, and let me just tell you, if you've ever heard one of these old church ladies that I've heard multiple times, and I'm not hating on old church ladies, but I've heard old church ladies, oh, I just wish everybody would get along, and the body of Christ would just come together, and you pastors would stop arguing and being about your name and your church and your place. Listen, lady, if it was your job to mandate everybody else on how to come together, God would have made you in charge, but you're not in charge. So guess what? Why don't you find a church, get in unity with that body and get in unity with that pastor, shut your mouth about other people and start talking about how you are going to get in unity with somebody around you. Come on, right? You know what I'm saying? We all want, it's easy to tell someone else. It's easy to be like, they just need to be more in unity. It's easy to talk about somebody else being in unity. Can anyone be in unity with you? Let me ask you, how many people are in unity with you? If you're supposed to lead a movement of unity, how many you got, sucker? Because I don't see a lot around you. Most people don't know how to tolerate you because you have more to tell than you do to give. And, and, and see, I, I could preach all day on this simply for the fact that we're, we, this is what transformed our history, their unity. See, all it took was 120 to come into unity, and it changed the world. I wonder if we could get 120 just to come in unity today. Then it says this, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. I want you to write this down, significant sound. I need a valuable sound. I need a worthy sound. There's a lot of sounds out there and a lot of people talking out there, but what's worth listening to? Is Fox and CNN your worthy sound in your life? What is the worthy sound? There is a sound of heaven, by the way, and if you learn how to get in tune with what heaven sounds like, all of a sudden the sound that comes from you will change as well. But as long as you tune out heaven, you're going to tune out your power. And God is saying if you start getting in tune with a significant sound in your life, the sound of of heaven. That's why the Bible says there is, a, there is a tongue of men and a tongue of angels. Why? Because there's a heavenly language. They're speaking in tongues and there's prophecy. Why? Because nobody can speak into tomorrow except the one who holds tomorrow. So if you get in tune with the sound, you'll be able to speak into an existence that no one yet knows and start speaking. Oh, am I quite? I feel like I'm in the Bible, in the book of Hebrews, and I'm preaching all over again. If you understand that you've got something in you to speak things into existence that are not so yet. Because you came into agreement with heaven rather than with everyone else. There's a lot of sound that we have, sound bites and 30-second clips. And we have all these little pieces. And, and, and let me just tell you, there was a sound from heaven that came as a mighty rushing wind. And, it's, and, and then listen, listen. Then it appeared to them divided tongues as a fire. And one, listen, listen, sat upon each of them. Well, I've I preached on tongues. I've preached on fire. i preached on all those things. I'm going to preach on the word sat. R- underline that right now. The Bible uses choice language for a reason. And the reason that this word is used right here. Here is because seated, seated, when it comes to anything in ministry, seated and sat means completed. So when he said, it could have said it rested. It could have said it came upon, it just, it could have used a lot of different languages, but it didn't use any other language or word. It used sat. It used a seated terminology, which means that the reason that he wanted to communicate this so powerfully and it was so important is because Jesus finished the salvation work at the cross, but the new covenant wasn't coming and wasn't completed until the outpouring of the Holy Spirit happened. And if it wasn't important, why would Jesus tell him it's so important for you to wait for it because there's power that's coming from heaven that's going to end endow you and empower you that that you might be a witness for me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. The Holy Spirit was coming and he was saying, and that's when it is completed. Let me prove it even further. The Bible says, how can you receive a testament as long as the testator liveth? In other words, as long as Jesus is alive and you haven't received the new covenant, the new covenant is engaged. 
And you don't get the new covenant when? You don't get the new covenant until Jesus is not only dead, but risen and ascended in heaven, seated in the right hand of authority. And when his Holy Spirit is poured out, that's when the new covenant happens. A lot of people think the New Testament, new covenant starts in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It begins in the book of Acts chapter 2. And so your new covenant that begins for you starts right here by understanding, Lord, this is a completed work in my life. And so I, if you've received Jesus Christ here, this is the God you never knew. If you received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know part of what God has for you. If you understand that the completed work is the infilling of the Holy Spirit and that I am not called because, listen, it's hard to feel significant and be a world changer and feel powerless at the same time. And all these disciples felt exactly that. I'm not smart enough. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough. I'm not big enough. I'm not this enough. I don't have enough. I don't, I don't know enough. I can't do enough. I'm not strong enough. I, I don't know. Jesus, we're not like you. How are, you, how are we going to do this? And they were freaking out. Road to Emmaus. All these different things. They had to go back and bring Peter back. They had to bring all these disciples back because they battled insecurity. Even though they knew the Messiah, they needed to know the power. And we need significant power in our life. Write that down. Significant power. I don't need power from my bank account. I don't need power from my po political stance. I don't need power from any other area in my life. I need real power. And you don't know what real power is until real power flexes. And what the Holy Spirit does in this moment, oh, I feel like preaching. The Holy Spirit comes down and fills that whole upper room. And after they, they are filled in the upper room, all of a sudden, the Bible says they came stumbling out. Woo! And I want you to think about that. This is a moment of provocation. Provocation means to be pushed out. You got pushed. Somebody say, I got pushed into this. <laughs> right? Mama made you. Some friend made you. You got pushed into this. And God says, because I didn't want you to stay in your comfort. If you have just stayed in the upper room, it would have stayed with you 120. But I wanted to fill you so powerfully that I pushed you right out of the upper room. And when you came stumbling out of the upper room, all of a sudden tens and tens of thousands of people gathered around. And Peter stood up at the day of Pentecost. And he says, we are not drunk with wine, but we are filled with the Holy Spirit of the living God. And it is the Jesus, the Messiah in us that now rules and reigns my mind and my heart. And he preaches one of the most powerful messages and leads 3,000 people to Jesus in that moment when was the last time you ever heard somebody preaching a message and 3,000 people being added to Jesus that day that's that's what listen that was Peter somebody say I'm Peter come on say it again I'm Peter you don't need to be th this person or that title or that position to be a world changer. You just need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter is a failure just like me and you. And Peter was insecure, uneducated. Peter didn't have the qualifications, the pedigree, or anything like that. But Peter led 3,000 people to Jesus in that moment when he denied him just shortly before. Why? Because he had significant power. And back to Joshua. Let me just tie it in. Joshua, the word scripture I gave you, Joshua starts leading the children of Israel into the promised land. He defeats Jericho. He defeats Ai. And then all of a sudden there's five kings that gather together and try to defeat him after he comes in agreement with Gibeon. And after he comes in agreement with Gibeon, then they get attacked. And when they're getting attacked, he says, hey, will you come and help us? So now I know I'm speed reading a lot. Go through the first 10 chapters and I'm, you'll get this history. But after they go through all this, that's when all of a sudden we hear the story of Joshua who's supposed to go out and defeat all these five kings by himself. And when he gets out there, all of a sudden the sun's going down. And he can't beat them all. And they're going to be left for a battle for another day, which is a whole other message. Sometimes God wants you to deal with something today so you don't have to fight, keep fighting it tomorrow and the next day. You don't deal with your enemies and your demons today. You're going to fight them in the next generations to come. And Joshua said, I'm not letting one of them escape because you told me all of them are going to go down. And so Joshua says, sun, stand still. Moon, stay right where you are. And that significant power of the Holy Spirit in him. Now, Joshua didn't understand physics and uh, astronomy like you and I, that you can't do that. Number one, the sun revo uh, doesn't revolve around the earth nor the moon. We revolve around that, right? And the moon revolves around us. He didn't understand all this. He didn't have the science behind it. And let me just tell you, that's a point of reference for all of us. You don't have to know it all for God to be able to do it all. Oh, when you can step out, I, I don't know how cancer really works. 
But, but God, I need you to heal this cancer right now. I need cancer to be in remission. God, I don't know how marriages really get back together, but God, I need you to step into my marriage and heal my marriage. God, I don't know how kids and prodigals come back to the Lord and how it all works out, but God, I need significant power in my life that I can call in heaven, that I can stop the sun, I can stop the moon, and I can speak with the anointing and the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, give God a big praise if you believe you need significant power in your life. Oh, give God a bigger praise. Come on, we're not done yet. No, come on. Hallelujah. Use your mouth, use your mouth, use your words. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we give you the highest praise. Listen, 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 listen. Stop talking about our economy and start declaring over our economy. Stop, stop, stop complaining about our politics and declare good men and women of God to be set in office. Stop talking about things and start declaring things. And I love how, God, how Joshua did it. This is what I'll, I'm going to show you what we do, and I'm going to show you what Joshua did. Joshua, we do this. We go to, hey man, giving me issues, bro. Give me problems. And, and, and they're like, that's, and, and because we had an issue with each other, you're like, you know what, Lord? deal with him <laughs> and we're like lord he's still there i don't you know he's not nice and you know i'm the good one and he's the bad one lord and we do this like a five-year-old going to dad mom <laughs> and, and we're, we're this is what we do with our we, we go and we're running jesus cancer jesus marriage and jesus my kids and jesus my finances and jesus, and jesus is saying i the living god have authority in heaven and earth and i have empowered you to go face your problems you don't need to come to me you need to go speak to that mountain you need to go speak to that son you need to go speak to your issue you need to take me to them and not bring them to me i want you to bring the power of god wherever you go Joshua didn't go to God. He went to the sun. He said, stop. Stay still. We got a battle to win. We got a city to change. We got a state to change. We got a nation for revival to break out. That's where we got to step in and change our vocabulary. Some of us, we, we've been grown up in this passive Christianity where we're just like, uh, Lord, if it's your will, you got to fight for this. And it's that significant power. I want to pray with you as we close. Will you stand with me? If you're, if you're not standing, go, go ahead and stand if you'd like. I want to encourage you. I want to close. Online too, stand to your feet. To get out of your bed. I want, I want to encourage you, if I haven't enough already, to say, you know what? I think I'm stronger than I thought. I think, I'm, I, think I'm, I think I have more power than I knew. Do you think Joshua wondered, like, son, stand still. Ugh. Let's see if it happens. <laughs> right? Yeah. He had to have had a moment. You wonder if Peter, sometimes Peter will walk up and say, be healed. You ever wonder if Peter was like, hopefully. <laughs> like, is it work? I saw Jesus. He stretched out his hand, and he said, be healed. <laughs> you ever wonder if their first couple miracles were with, like, one eye open, seeing if it'll work? Because they said, he, even Paul said, I have doubt, but help me with my unbelief. I'm, I'm a man. I'm a person. I'm a human. I have doubt. But, that, but that at the same time, I have this power, this significant power that I could step out in and say, I'm not going to do, we're not going to deal with this anymore. No, we got some issues in our city. We got some issues in that. We got some issues in families and friends and loved ones. I'm done. <laughs> I'm done going to the Lord and saying, God, will you please deliver my family member of addiction? I'm going to addiction this time, and I'm going to remind addiction who my God really is. Because, see, that, that, that's the biggest part is it's David, David went to Goliath. He didn't go to the Lord and say, Lord, this big, ugly giant is in the way. You're, I'm supposed to be king. Will you just strike him with a lightning bolt to give me credit? That's how most of us live our walk of Christianity. But God's saying, will you be bold enough to go face the giant and let the giant know who I am? Because if you'll let the giant know who, who the God you serve, all of a sudden I'll help you take down the giant. But I want to do it together. Can we work together? Can we come into agreement together? <clears throat> 
And I believe if we get this message and actually leave here today with that, with that revelation in our mind and our heart and our spirit, we will change this whole country. We really will. We really will. We'll change it. The day of Pentecost changed history. Why can't we? Why can't Flagstaff? Why can't Bridge Church? Why can't this upper room? I want to pray with you. Don't bow your heads. You can do whatever you want. Close them, your eyes, keep them up, keep them down. But I want some boldness to happen in this room because I'm going to pray and I'm going to ask you to be bold. Raise your hand, step out in faith, maybe even come down to the altar, whatever it may be. But I want to pray for some physical healings right now. If there's somebody in this house that needs a physical healing in your body, I want you to stretch your hand out towards heaven and I want to pray for you. Raise your hand nice and high if you can. If your shoulder's hurting, if that's it, then I want you to lay your hand wherever it is. If, and, and if you've got an issue and you know where it's at and you can put your hand on it, put your hand on it. Keep your hand up. Keep your hand up. Now, everybody, because this is why I wanted to keep your eyes open, your heads up. If you see somebody near you uh, with their hand up, uh, you're going to help me pray for them. Now, don't be weird, okay? You're going to just touch them. The Bible tells us to lay hands on each other, James chapter 5. If you don't think laying hands on each other is, 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 is necessary for healing, you need to read the Bible. So we're, we're, James chapter 5 says to lay hands on each other. So what we're going to do is I just want you to lay hands on them and you can pray a prayer with me, but I'm going to pray a prayer over them and we're going to come into agreement because we just don't have enough room at this altar. So stretch, find somebody near you who's got their hand up. Find somebody near you. Find somebody near you. Everybody find somebody. Don't be weird and touch them with a pinky. Don't be awkward and not touch anybody because you're just weird. Touch somebody. Find somebody. Everybody get into unity and one accord. And let's do this together. And I want you to pray out loud with me and pray over them like you're praying for your own blood. Lord, in Jesus' name, I, I pray right now. God, Lord, every sickness, every disease, Lord, every healing that needs to take place, Lord, you would do it, God, Lord, right now. And we would feel it in our bones, God. We would feel it in our heart and our mind, God. We would feel it, God, Lord, from the top of our head to the soles of our feet. In the name of Jesus, I pray for an outpouring of the Holy Spirit right now that a move of God would take place and significant power wouldn't just come from one man or one woman but it would come from the body of believers that know how to walk in authority and power with the most high God and see the world change and see miracles, signs and wonders, healing and deliverance and Lord right now in the name of Jesus I pray that we would see it, feel it, hear it and, and right now in this moment right in this moment and if that's you and somebody just prayed for you and you know you got healed and you can feel it, I want you to just start clapping your hands and thanking the Lord. Come on, give God a big, come on, give God a big praise. <clears throat> now, if you didn't feel it, if you didn't feel the healing, if you didn't feel that healing, let me just tell you, it's okay, it's good. Because that means God's not done. Don't take it as a sign of it didn't happen. Say, oh, there's more. So uh, God's not finished with me yet, so I'll just keep going. I've had the same thing happen before where I prayed 14 years. Lord, heal me from infertility and help me, me and my wife have a child. Guess what? Didn't happen when I prayed it. Didn't happen, didn't happen. All of a sudden, it happened. Why? Because I'm not giving up. God's not done yet. God's not done yet. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. We're so glad you joined us today. If you made a spiritual decision, whether that was dedicating your life to Christ or rededicating your life to Christ, send us an email at info at rearbridge.church and let us know you made that spiritual decision. Also, if you're joining our Bridge Church family online for the first time, we have a very special gift for you. Send us an email at info at rearbridge.church to share some information on where we can send you that gift. We're so glad you joined us today, and we can't wait to see you soon. Be sure to stay connected, because we're so much better together. together.